Day one, the encounter. Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah 1, 2 through 3. Nothing will shake a man, or at any rate, a man like me, out of his merely verbal thinking and his merely notional beliefs. He has to be knocked silly before he comes to his senses. C.S. Lewis Some men worship rank, some worship heroes, some worship power, some worship God. And over these ideals they dispute, but they all worship money. Mark Twain Nehemiah led a comfortable life. He held a stately position in the most powerful kingdom on earth. He owned a beautiful house near the Palace of Susan, with a pool shaded from the afternoon sun by giant palms and where breezes gently crept over the waters in the summer months, making the Persian heat bearable. He would pass entire days luxuriating in his floating lounger and sipping those little drinks with the pink umbrellas. He was wealthy, content, and well-fed. As the king's cupbearer, Nehemiah was charged with the vital task of tasting King Artaxerxes' wine to make sure it was not poisoned. Though this might appear to be a risky and thankless position, it was actually highly coveted, and it permitted intimate access to the king and required his utmost trust. As such, the king and Nehemiah grew close, and he reaped the many benefits such a relationship offers. One can imagine Nehemiah's struggle then, when his brother Han and I and some friends came over for a chat. It started innocently enough when Nehemiah casually asked his brother, what of our people and the city where we used to live? The answer his brother gave changed everything. Nehemiah's brother said to paraphrase, our people are being beaten up and taken advantage of once again. And the neighborhood we lived in looks like a bomb hit it. The news of the mournful and desolate condition of Jerusalem wounded Nehemiah deeply. What started as just the guys hanging out, perhaps playing golf or tennis or watching Sunday football, turned ugly. This exchange, though, brought greater gain, greater meaning, and greater reward than any other single meeting he had ever had. Nehemiah was more than destined for this moment. He was created for it, but he was not prepared for it. You see, this is your moment, your time, not just to seize the day, but to rise to the occasion. Yes, you! Not just the person who may buy this book, but you, the person reading this in the airport, on the plane, in the office, or maybe over someone's shoulder. Yes, you. We are never completely prepared for the defining moment of life. Until then, we may wander and wander, never finding our way. We only settle for things that substitute or distract us from the goal of intense financial satisfaction. Even though we will be focusing on the life of Governor Nehemiah, and his financial decisions, convictions, and heart changes along the way. The rest of God's word speaks about money and possessions over 2,350 times. Most are warnings or instructions of how not to handle money in order to avoid financial pain. When Larry Burkett, the founder of Christian Financial Concepts, now Crown Financial Ministries, was alive and teaching this message, he loved to quote a saying by the wealthiest and wisest man who ever lived, Solomon. It is the blessing of the Lord that brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. The amount you have been entrusted with, whether it is 500 a month or 500 an hour, is a blessing from God, and he will add no trouble or sorrow to it if you choose to do it his way. Why? Is he a showboat, a glory hog, or a self-consumed egotistical cosmic Darth Vader? No, he genuinely cares about us so much more than we can possibly comprehend and wants to save us from the heartache that lies in wait for us when we do it our way. Since God has proven his love for us by dying, coming back to life, and promising to always be with us and never replace us with another love, then we can and should trust him with something comparatively minor, our finances. This book is about the financial life that God wants to give us, one of great joy and peace. It is a financial life that bears no scars from the wounds inflicted by the world's ways. 
one that will speak silently of the hope God has infused into us to pour into the lives of others so that they may experience the depth and intense pleasure of his love in their lives. In Romans 15, 13, he tells us through Paul, the Jewish Pharisee turned follower, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The great news is that you don't have to be a financial guru, a bean counter, or even a bookkeeper. God empowers you to do great things in the area of money. And as a result, he is glorified and we get all the joy. What an incredible concept. He gets a credit, more people's lives change, and we receive the most coveted and elusive lifetime quest, joy and peace. Money can't buy it, but it's attainable with God's currency. This is not a book on finance management or leadership. This is about building enough margin in your life to glean real meaning from its intended use. Nehemiah's financial choices made him one of the finest financial role models in the ancient scriptures. Applying these financial principles and convictions will give you the bricks and mortar to construct your financial fortress.